All right. It's that time. It's time for Beyond Sight and Sound. Let's do this. Are you looking for a high-quality beach and sand scoop? Are you trying to take your hunting to the extreme? How about an American-based company that stands behind their product and everything they sell? Then check out our friends over at Extreme Scoops. John has been making scoops for some time now and makes a quality beach and sand scoop to take your hunting to the next level. Extreme Scoops recently released their new sand shredder that works great in the water and on the beach. And if you're a new Equinox user, you may want to check out his Surfmaster X3 that can trap those small targets you new Equinox users are finding out there. Extreme Scoops company approach is let's do it right. So do it right, buy it once, and go to the extreme. Extremescoops.com That's X-T-R-E-M-E scoops.com Caution. Please do not operate motor vehicles or power equipment while under the influence of this show. Listening to this show could cause side effects such as bouts of laughter, violent binges of cabin fever, and even dreams of silver and gold. Please be advised. Now that the fine print is out of the way, on with the show. All right, we're back and we're live once again. You are listening to... Beyond Sight and Sound, Metal Detecting, and Treasure Hunting Radio for all the really cool digging people out there. And when I look into the chat, I see that looks like everybody's around. Everyone's having a grand time already. You guys are just really, really kind of tearing it up. Nice. I see that Stan's in. I see that the Bills are in. Tom is in. Uh, Jason. Let's see. You see Jason's in. Larry's in. Welcome aboard. And I also see that uh, Bill is saying that he's uh, planning on trapping some raccoons tonight. Hmm. Well, I guess it is what it is. Uh, what's what's up with that, Bill? Are you uh, needing a couple of digging buddies or what? <laughs> I see that Paul is also in, and uh, Mark as well. Nice. Good to see. Good to see. So hopefully everything is coming through all right. Uh, tried to do some checking into things oh, after uh, Wednesday's show. And it seemed like whatever the hiccup was that we had with Skype has worked itself out. 
So we'll see how it goes. Hopefully everything is working okay properly with Skype. We'll see how it goes. Hopefully it does. So tonight, obviously, open lines, wildlife encounters. I uh, hadn't necessarily planned on it, but I do recall mentioning towards the end of the show Sunday that we would go ahead and, you know, try to do the open lines, uh, the wildlife encounters, and see if anybody had any stories that they would like to share with us. I mean, we have heard, uh, we have heard some in the past from Chuck. He's always had some great stories. Uh, we've heard in the past from Steve as well that he's had a couple of great wildlife encounters. Steve's in the chat too. They're different, Steve, but hey, welcome aboard. Coming in from, uh, Mississippi, if I remember correctly, is where he's at. Yeah, so we got Mississippi, Florida, Michigan, Ohio, uh, quite a few areas coming in. Good to see. Good to see. All right, so we'll see what's going on. First and foremost, get the other things out of the way. The link's in the description. Our friends over at Shooters and Prospectors, Chuck Smalley, the man with the plan, the dealer choice, the dealer we like to uh, promote here on the show. Uh, our friends over at Extreme Scoops. Be sure and check them out. Good quality scoops. Our friends at Detectees.com. Ken, Mark, Darth, Buddy, and the gang doing a great job with things. And always working on trying to mix things up a little bit as well. They're always up to something. Welcome to Nelson. Hmm. And it seems like... I don't know. Hmm. Uh... Obviously, then after that, our friends over at uh, XP Team USA, their Facebook group, website, podcast, blog articles. You can also find their YouTube channel. Just search YouTube for XP Team USA. Go to their website. You can find it through there as well. And then I believe that, no, that doesn't cover all the links. Actually, then we do still have the links in the description tonight yet because I just, I grabbed everything from Wednesday's show and drug it over to tonight. So we do have the links in there still for River Sticks Outdoors YouTube, Facebook, and uh, contest link. So for those who did uh listen in Wednesday and went over and subbed River Sticks Outdoors or left him a comment on one of his videos, whichever video that may have been. Always appreciated to see the interaction and the activity. Very appreciated. He's trying to get his channel up there a little bit. And the way well the way it sounds, things worked out quite well for him so if you had uh went over and subscribed very much appreciated and if you had went over and tried to enter the contest for the hundred dollar gift card all i can say is please please watch the contest video and read the description Just like we said before with the pulse dive, you know, everybody's got to follow the rules. So when it comes time to draw, if you have not followed the rules, well, you, you just may find out that you're not a winner. That's just the way it goes. So something to keep in mind. If you were entering, planning on entering, have entered, anything like that, by all means, make sure to read the rules. 
And uh, we do see that Chuck is in the chat. Very good. So who knows? He may call in and share some of his wildlife encounters with us tonight, since that's kind of, you know, what we're structuring around tonight are wildlife encounters. Whether they've been out in the field, in the water, uh, wherever. And we'll see what happens. Other than that, around here. Oh, yeah. Hello, Chuck. And we see the pirate herself is in. Barb. Which, actually, speaking of Barb, uh, after Wednesday's show, the way it looked from the screenshots that were reviewed and everything, uh, speaking with River Sticks Outdoors, Barb was actually the first person to complete all three steps that I had mentioned on the show Wednesday. There were a lot of people that came in right behind her, but it looked like from the screenshots, it was one of those deals where a number of people had went over to YouTube, and she went over to Facebook first. Maybe a couple of other people went to Facebook first as well. But she was able to complete all three tasks that were mentioned on the show. So, Barb was the winner. And we uh, we got her prize shipped out to her. <sighs> I want to say uh, Thursday. Late Thursday, I believe, that was shipped out. So hopefully, she should be receiving that soon. So, congratulations to Barb on her win of the Megalodon round Wednesday night. She should have that in a few days. And who knows, maybe she's even got some wildlife encounters to share with us. I know if we had titled the show uh, Shovel Encounters, maybe she might have had a little bit of input on that. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. We still love you, Barb. <laughs> oh, so <clears throat> we coming up to this, we did have a few kind of short tidbits of wildlife encounters shared with us Wednesday. I don't know. I I uh I know Chuck knows that that's what we're kind of discussing tonight. Uh I did shoot a message off to Steve. I don't know if he'll chime in with any other wildlife encounters. I'm sure that Chuck probably will. And who knows? Maybe if Bill's planning to uh, trap himself a couple of digging buddies tonight, he may even have some wildlife encounters. I'm going to have to go back in the chat after the show and see what the deal is with the raccoon. What is the deal with the raccoon, Bill? I'm not sure. Hmm. So we'll see. <clears throat> anyway, tonight we got a little bit of a late start. Fashionably late, I guess you could say. I think when I looked at the screen, it was actually 8.03 when we went live instead of our traditional 8 o'clock. I'm a little behind trying to take care of some very last-minute things, and you could say we kind of... <laughs> we kind of went live in the dark, so to speak. We're we're kind of building a plane as we fly it right now. Had a little bit of a technical glitch come up here on my end at the very last minute, so we've tried to work around it. Hopefully we've gotten around it. I don't know. I'm still picking up just... Uh, just a hair of an echo over here on my end. Hopefully that's not transmitting out to the listeners. We'll see. I don't know. Let me try something real quick. Yeah, I don't know if it's if the echo is going to transmit or not. Maybe I can uh 
clip it out after the show. I don't know. We'll see. So, yeah, wasn't uh, planning on doing anything real extravagant. Make sure we got the Skype hiccup solved from Wednesday. And since I had mentioned wildlife encounters, uh, actually all of us had kind of mentioned it Wednesday. Figured, well, I think we did say we'd try to try to bring that up soon. So we figured we'd see what happens. We're flying in the dark by the seat of our pants like a bat. But, hey, it could work. And there's another one for wildlife encounters. You know, they're, a lot of people don't realize it. Bats are actually warm to the touch. Of course, that's what you get for a winged rodent, right? Basically. I'm trying to recall, uh, last year... I think it was maybe early last year, I believe, Bill had, well, let's see here. Yeah, speaking of detectives, they're in the house themselves already. And let's see here if I can pull him through. I don't know. I think I got him. Yeah, I got him. Yeah. It's working this time. Well, yeah, for now. It worked. For now. For now. It is. It is. Yes. Have you been getting any digging in, Chuck? Yeah, I was out today. I got a nice silver thimble. I'm working on a spot that I've had permission on for quite some time, and I've hunted it quite a bit. But I, I, I do a little comparison hunting with the Knox and the Amphibio and uh, then pull out the 30-30 and cover spots. And uh, there's not much left behind, but I got a nice silver thimble and a bunch of iron with that Equinox. And then uh, wheat pennies, deep wheats, and uh, but I pulled a lot of Indian heads out of here, and a lot of uh, barber uh, v nickels, typical stuff, some rings. <clears throat> and I will all run up there today, and that's about 35 miles north of me. And uh, uh, it's changing hands; they're changing owners on it. So I thought I'd get one last shot up there. Right? Yeah the the window of opportunity is getting short, maybe. Right, and it's, they've got where a house was tore down, they put a garage up, but the front yard of that house has produced many silvers, many, many silvers. And that's where I got the, the thimble, too, today. But it was a little rough. Now, just out of curiosity, oh, was it been up or anything? It just crushed in about halfway. Mm. Some no. breaks around the edges. It was near the driveway area. Now, just out of curiosity, well, that would make sense, uh, being right there near the drive area, especially if it's a gravel drive, it could be beat up a little bit. But uh, with you just finding that today, what sort of a signal did that give you on the Equinox? Well, I had iron all around it. I could hear Oh, yes, the iron. it's jumping. And all I was getting was a squeak out of the middle of it, and I did get a 30. And I'm thinking, hmm. So I better dig this, and I literally took one chunk, one nail out and away, and there was the, when I pulled the nail up, I could see the silver. It was down about mm, seven, eight inches, and uh, uh, there was the old thimble. Nice. So I cleaned yeah, I... it up and put, rolled it out a little bit and gave it to Jill. Oh, I bet she likes that. Oh, she got a bunch of them. Nice. Yeah, I wasn't I wasn't sure if that would ring up uh, you know, right there maybe dime quarter range or a little lower since it was a thimble. Somewhere in that range, yeah, it was more quarterish, but it was just a brief but it was consistent every angle I moved around it, so it had to be dug. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh kinda like with that little sterling infant's ring I hit the other day. Right. And you can you can check it out on uh, my uh, Facebook page. I do a short live afterwards. I have phones going off and all kinds of stuff, but a little live with it. So yeah, it was fun. Nice. Well, in, you... in amongst misty day here, it was kind of cool and drizzling all day till late mm. in the afternoon. Yeah, we've had overcast. We've had we had downpours this morning. Then it went to kind of a soaking rain and. 
I think the rain's cleared up for the time being for us. We've got more coming in tomorrow, but it's still overcast and just the humidity is something fierce. Yeah. Well, we got a series of storms coming at us right now that popped up a little while ago and out toward Anamosa and that they had a tornado on the ground with it. So hopefully that's dying off a little bit. But now we've got the black line coming at us, just a series of thunderstorms. Hopefully we don't get to go out and play in that, but uh, that's the way it is. I've noticed one thing, and I don't know if the rest of you with the high water around you, the number of snakes that are out is phenomenal. You know, yeah, that would make sense, because if the water's high, well, they're getting ran out of their homes, aren't they? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. You didn't run across any of them today, did you? Uh, no, not today. Yesterday I had one make me do the two-step back until I figured out what it was. He'd come up over the riverbank, and mm, they're cruising through the yard. And <laughs> I generally won't bother them, especially right. if they're ones I want around. You know, the bull snakes and the garter snakes and those, they're good to have. It's some of the other ones that you kind of raise an eyebrow out and go, I don't know if I want you around or not. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 Some of them can prove to be a, a bit problematic, especially if they want to try to bite into you. Right. Right. So that that's been around. Other than all the typical critters that we got between the, and that's forced out a lot of deer. I'm seeing a lot more deer in the urban areas because a lot of the lowlands and timbers are all flooded so they moved up in there and so that makes a little dicey driving and uh, that type of stuff so oh yeah yeah we seen uh here the other night uh a friend of tam's their i think their son was riding on the interstate with a motorcycle and a deer hit him or he hit the deer mm -hmm. one whichever way you want to call it but it's not good on a motorcycle no. Yeah. I've I been to several of those incidences that were bad for both the deer and the driver. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think actually he's still in the hospital currently as we speak. So that one, uh, that didn't pan out well for either of them. I'm, I'm pretty safe to, it's pretty safe to say it really didn't pan out well for the deer and we're hoping that it pans out as good as can be for him. Yeah. Yeah, so, I didn't know, I thought maybe you were going to get Steve on here too, too tonight, I haven't seen him slide in tonight. Right, I did, I did send him a quick start. message, yeah, I did send him a quick message uh, a little while before the show, but, you know, maybe he's, uh, maybe he's reviewing his new book, I don't know. <laughs> Could be, yeah, I'm try, anxious to get hands on that. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm interested in reading it. I think it's going to be a very good book. I mean, obviously, uh, speaking with Steve, I don't know if you've had the opportunity to speak with him in person or not, but even just speaking with him over the phone, he's he's got a charisma about him. Yes, he does. I've got to chat with him quite a few times, not in person. He's called, I've called, we've done different things, and 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 uh, I like him. He's he's cool. Yeah, I don't see how how a person can't nope. not like him. <laughs> he, he he's one of those people you just want to kind of sit and have a good talk with. Maybe get to go out sometime do a little hunting. Yeah, absolutely. That was the uh, let's see, 2016. I was out in Mass for the Silver City Treasure Show there in Taunton, and. Me and Steve got to spend quite a bit of time together that weekend, and that was the only thing we weren't able to get time for, was to get out and do a little bit of hunting together. Yep. Now, Barb's talking about the elk in her area, and somebody goes, what elk? Well, down in Bob, Barb's area, they're trying to get the woodland elk herds back up to the size they used to be, and uh, and and... That's pretty cool. Southern Illinois, they they transplanted some of the woodland elk in and hope, hoping they can get a herd going, too. Oh, nice. I hadn't known that. 
So oh. Barb's got elk down there she's got to watch out for on the roads. Right. Well, and she's got to watch for the snakes, too. Uh, the snakes down there aren't so friendly. No. No, she's got, she got several of them down there that you don't want to tangle with, from copperheads on up to Maswagwa or the, uh, the timber rattlers all the way to the big eastern diamondbacks, and they get big. And, uh, Mark was talking there a second ago. What was he putting up there? I lost it. Uh oh. Something to do with gators. Oh, the grizzly bears getting chased, uh, chasing people on bicycles. I've seen some of those videos. You know what? That turns those people into Olympic class bicyclists. <laughs> Right, that yeah. One guy, that one that. chased him through the woods pretty well. <laughs> right, you'd, I don't you'd, know. Be, you'd be amazed how quick you can pedal at that point. I'll bet you can pedal like a son of a gun. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. It's... There's, a video, there's a video out there from GPA years ago. Tom Massey was riding on what they call the Corduroy Road up there. And he literally, they hadn't noticed, but all of a sudden alongside of him was a young grizzly bear just running, and Tom is on an ATV. And so he speeds up, and the bear speeds up. And literally they're side by side with about 15 yards between them. So Tom speeds up more and gets away. But that bear was pacing, they said, at about 38 mile an hour, and didn't even look like it was winding him. That really puts things in perspective to how quick these creatures can move. That's right. And, and you know, sometimes, sometimes things occur, and if you're not aware of your surroundings, you're not paying attention, you get concentrating on one thing or another, especially detecting or... Uh, other various things that you're outside doing. Next thing you know, you got a situation at hand, and it's not good because something right. come up on you and you didn't hear or notice it. Yeah, and like you said, it's it's not only just detecting. If I remember right, I think you had uh, shared a story of uh, years back. I think you were actually out game hunting when you uh, realized you had a number of wolves up on the ridge line watching you. Yes. Yes, and, I mean, you get that feeling of being watched. And, and most all of us will have that happen one one time or another, and it leaves you uneasy. And I just caught a movement above me out of the corner of my eye, and there's wolves. Oh, they were up that ridge line. They were probably 50, 60 yards just sitting and watching. And that unnerved me, too. I mean, it's like, well, where did you come from and how long you been there? <laughs> right, and how long do you plan on staying here? What are your intentions? Because I think mine are to leave. <laughs> well, you know, in, 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 it, it leaves you unnerved a little bit. And I'm sure there's others out there that have run into some problems. And, and you know, Don Mark talked about a little bit the gators down there you know those guys like to work those water lines and and things like that and some of the interior they just took a one yes yes excuse me hmm. yes i did anyway yeah sometimes down there in florida especially in the areas where your visibility may not be so clear uh, sure. i don't know I, I don't think i want to be jumping in there with any gators yeah, and it goes all the way from the largest down to the smallest things that we deal with, and and I, I ticks and and that kind of stuff, and being aware and doing things right to keep them off you as best as you can. That's a bad deal. That Lyme disease is a bad deal. Oh yeah, absolutely. And and the way it sounds, there's there's even you know you can be as prepared as possible, and somehow. You know, one slips through the defenses, you let your guard down, whatever, and next thing you know, now you're you're stuck, you're dealing with it. Yes, and our Ohio Relic Hunter, Lyman Ticks suck, yes, that's correct. Yeah, Bill uh, knows. 
and build those. And then Definitely. Mark's talking about the, it's not the ones you can see, it's the ones that you can't see that unnerve you, and you're right. And uh, it, it's some of it comes out funny, some of it's not so funny. Right. And, uh, some of it you find you can laugh about it later, and others maybe not so much. Yeah, there's a old narrow gauge railway that runs up out of Nome, Alaska, and it's no longer in service. It was they took them up, took the miners up to the gold fields every day and brought them back, and uh, they brought loads of ore back to be processed and things like that. And uh, if you can find those load points, those are good spots to nugget hunt. And I was working along the old rail bed, and in fact, they made the rail beds out of tailings. Oh, so nice. Those are hunt too. Right. So you hunt those rail beds, and I found some good gold along them, and I'm digging one day, and it was another deal where I stopped and just happened to look up, and at about 20 feet, I've got a big red fox just sitting there watching me, trying to figure out what I was doing. Where it came from, when it came in, I don't know, but it was like, Oh, I'm not paying attention to what's going on here. Right, he just I had got company up sneak up. You know that that's the kind of stuff that it just happens, and uh, I wasn't worried about the fox bothering me. He was probably trying to figure out what's that crazy guy digging for. Right, but, wondering uh, if you had some food for him or something. Well, they get to be little bums up there because they aren't used to having people around, and you they'll they'll come right up to the camp. They'll come right in around you. And um, they like Vienna sausages. <laughs> we'll flip them a Vienna sausage out of a can. If you give them a broken one, they'll eat it. If not, you flip them a full one, they literally take off with it, whether they take them back to pups to feed them or they bury them, I don't know, or whatever. But we've, we've had several of them. We had one, uh, there was a, a place that we stayed way out, and we called it the Blue Room because it had a... Uh, you know, that blue tarp, that's that's what it was. The roof was covered with a blue, those blue tarps. And we were staying in a blue room for two weeks running a dredge camp. And uh, we had a fox coming in, and we'd flip her rods in, and she'd either eat it or take it back to her young ones. And she'd curl up and literally lay about 20 feet out from us. And we'd be talking. She just hung around. And the one night she sat up, and she's looking back toward the stream, and she bristled. I mean, she bristled, and she turned and took off, and Arlen and I were sitting there, and, and Arlen says, that ain't good. No, no. that ain't good. Yeah, no, she's not at all. There. I didn't, well, you don't go looking, but that's when I went and grabbed the 44 and had it in my lap, and then we, that was about 1 a.m. We'd come in, I mean, it's July in Nome, you got 24 hours of daylight, and we've been working quite a while on the dredges, and uh, the next day, I went down along the stream, and there was a, if you can imagine, a dinner plate size footprint of a grizzly. Who oh, boy. And only 30 yards from us going upstream. She heard him. She knew he was there. She bristled and left. So if you see that kind of reaction, that's when you got to sit and pay attention. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, just like with, with you and, and him that night, my first thought would be, okay, you know, something's going on because what just spooked her to take off? Yep. So, you know, if watching your situations around you can tell you a lot. And she took out of there, I mean, not on a dead run, but it was, I'm leaving. <laughs> right, yeah, thanks for the grub. I'm and gone. Was, and we both thought the same thing, but he said it, that ain't good. I said, no, no, it's not. No, it's not. Not at all. Yeah, it sounds like that one could have been a, a whole lot closer call than it was, but even at that, that's close enough for that size of paw print. Yep, so. Barb's listening to the hockey game. Go Blues. <laughs> I couldn't even tell you who's playing. That That's all right. That's all right. She's listening. She's pulling for Boston. Oh, so, I not imagine that. Yeah, that Matt sounds like... No Matt, Matt says Mike what? Says, Pink elephants. Well, Mike, no more of the medication tonight. Right, yeah, it sounds like he's sitting okay. <laughs> not so, too bad. 
No, no. But you know that's the kind of stuff when you're out there, even even in a park. You know, you get up around the outer edges of the timber and stuff. Keep your eyes open. Oh, absolutely. At, especially in Florida. I mean, some of these parks oh, are man. they're not fenced in or whatever, and you've got travelers, I they're, guess you could say, you know, coming yes. in from out of the state, and they're going, oh, look, this looks like a nice place to get out and walk my little Pomeranian, not even realizing yeah. that, you know, you, you're out there with an alligator Scooby snack. Well, there's a park, that, uh, it's outside, Orlando's got a lot of gators in those lakes. And we found that out a few years ago. I went down and I it was at Kelly Co. for my lab. And then actually that's when I went and and went to uh, the hunt down there with Mark and those guys. I actually went to one of their club meetings. Had a lot of fun with them. But we were at one park and we were talking with that park because they had closed metal detecting down. And we wanted to know what, why, and so on. They took us out. And one of the biggest things is they have sprinkler systems in all through there and it's buried and they were getting some of their lines cut because they're hitting the sprinkler head as a target hitting it with the shovel and cutting the lines and then they got to go in and repair those those units can cost by the time they pay the guy to repair them and the parts and pieces it was 800 bucks a piece but they were going to open up the non-sprinkler areas but they had uh, fences all along the lake down below and they showed me where a big gator had gotten over a six-foot fence into this wallow. And whether she was going to lay eggs there or what, but they, they just a couple of days before we had gotten there, they had to shoot the gator and haul it out, and they had to use a, a loader. That gator was in the 800 to 850-pound range to get it in a truck to get it out of there. Wow. And that had made news all over down there, and... and uh, Jill wanted to do some kayaking, and the guy at the park said, we used to rent kayaks here, no longer too many gators, and they follow kayaks. <laughs> wow. So that ended that story. Right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And and it's a good point you make, too, about the uh, the sprinkler systems. I mean, really, uh, it's it's very costly. It's a very pricey repair for the park or, or whatever other area that the, the sprinkler system is in like that. And those things sound off so nice, but realistically, for most of them, if you just take some time and work with the signal, uh, you know, size your signal, you're going to pick up on that pipe, and, and you would think anyway, hey, this signal's running, you know, three and a half feet to the left, don't bother digging it. Don't damage the uh, the irrigation, the the sprinkler system. That's right. But there have been a uh, number yeah. of areas closed due to that. Yep, and and that's one of the biggest problems. Uh, and then I went down and talked to another county down there and sat with the county supervisor and the parks commissioner and the whole thing because they were closing down parks left and right down there. But it was not for that reason. It was just for a reason that there may be something archaeological there, and we are the keepers of this ground. And I said, yes, and I agree with you, you are that, but what site is so archaeologically sensitive you have to shut it down to everything? And we had a long conversation because I, I sat on a park commission for quite a while. And, uh, one of the, one of the board. And, you know, we left the park open except for one area where we have Indian mounts up on the top. And, uh, no digging was allowed up there. And that's actually state and federal law, but we just shut that area off. But the rest of the area is still open, open to this day for you to go out and detect because it dates back into the 1830s in a couple locations in there. And, uh, I told them this. He, but you're you're the caretaker of that. Yep, and then you know if somebody's making a massive problem, I hope they self police it. And most of everything's went along real good through that. But down there, they just didn't want to believe that. Right? Yeah. Some people they uh, they just get in this mindset that it doesn't matter 
what the suggestion is, what the solution could be that you may have to present them with, it won't work. And they, they become very close-minded about it. And a, a lot of the times, it is just something as simple as educating the uneducated. If if yep. we can explain to them what we do, how we do it, why we do it, but uh, sometimes it falls on deaf ears. Uh, you can explain it all you want till you're blue in the face, and they're still not going to change their perspective at all. But that's that's nope. a good thing about like you know Central Florida Metal Detecting Club. They've they've gone a long way at uh, the the politics of things, so to speak, in trying to get some of those areas open back up for hunters. Yep, I hope I hope they can win the good fight. We've done it in a couple other areas down in Carthage. We opened kept it open down there, and a couple here throughout Illinois. But you can't get the uh, couple of them all they they won't do it especially ones in chicago over in the uh uh forestry area they closed all that down because guys were going in and literally tearing it up and how do you how do you get them to open it back up that's parts of that are closed that's a shame yeah and, there uh, there were a lot of people making some good finds out of those areas too oh uh, yeah yes they were but you so, can forget about getting talking in about there now. Getting the case. barb's been talking about some bees that she's had problems with that's another way to watch we've got the hornets i and we've got the white and black ones too barb and, and they're no fun ground hornets we ran into tom lindemeyer and i were working in wyoming and we were doing a drift and a drift is where you don't really tunnel in but you work back into a location and we were working back in and and high banking the material and detecting the tailings as they come out and making sure we're doing all right. We did good in there, but the one day Tom was in there putting a little shore up. We'd been back, we're back about three and a half, four feet in on this load or whatever you want to call it. And he made a chop and opened up a ground hornet's nest. He come out of there on a dead run, man. He had him on him and, uh, I took off and then he got stung about three, four times. And just kept moving. He said, not going back in there. Well, I, I ran the Lander, Wyoming, which is about 45 miles, and I came back with a wasp and hornet spray, and we took care of that so we could keep working. Wow. And those, I mean, when it comes to the uh, the ground nests like that, you've literally, you've got no warning. You don't even know they're there no. until you've already stumbled on it. And by then, like you said, dead run. Because it, it's too late. you you got to get out of Dodge. Right. That's I, bad stuff. I wonder if Barb's ever had a run-in with any copperheads. I know any she's, run-ins with those, anybody? I know she's had some run-ins with some snakes. I don't know that they were necessarily copperheads. They may have been. I'm not real sure. But she, so, you know, she has had some run-ins it, with the snakes. From the smallest to the biggest, you got to from ticks and mosquitoes and gnats all the way up to grizzly bears and whatever else gators that we run into. Keeping your wits about you is a pretty important thing. Right, and that that even goes right down to the, uh, you know, like you said, the smaller the smaller things out there, the ticks, the mosquitoes, even some of the spiders. I mean, we we have had some issues up here with the uh, brown recluse. Oh, those aren't good. No. Mike's, Mike's still running into pink elephants. Barb says she's only running into rattlers, which is bad enough. Right, yeah, that's still enough. I, I wouldn't want to mess with them either. Ooh. So, you know, all that kind of stuff, and, and, and then, then you got to kick in. If you're having a problem with them, I saw a picture today of a guy that got bit. It was on Facebook. I don't know if he's a detectorist or what, showing his forefinger that got bit by what he called a baby rattler. And that was nasty looking, black and swollen. Right. And, um, when you're reaching down and in for stuff, and especially if you're working rocky areas, <laughs> that's not good. No, huh? Yeah, and and when it comes to like the rattlers, I think I'd I'd just as soon deal with a mature one rather than a young one. I don't want to deal with them at all. 
Well, yeah, but I mean, the young ones they haven't <laughs> they haven't learned how to regulate that venom yet. So if they bite you, your life will get a full dump. Yeah, Digger Stan on here says a a recluse bit him and he almost lost his thumb. That's some nasty stuff. Yeah, such a little bitty thing, but they can wreak all sorts of havoc, just like the ticks. Yeah. Them things, they're they're no good at all. I ain't, I ain't got much use for them in my book at, at all. Be careful, Matt, if you got to go for a fire call. I'm just watching the board. Right. Here. Well, and Matt, I don't know, the last I heard, things were pretty hot for down there in his area, so he hadn't been out hunting. But uh, I'm not sure if he had tuned in Wednesday or not. I know you had heard it when, when Steve had mentioned. Apparently... <clears throat> Up north of, you know, Matt's area, because I think Matt's down in, actually in South Carolina, and I believe Steve said North Carolina, uh, some, some teenager had lost their leg from a shark. Oh! So yeah, so I guess they're that, running pretty yeah. good. That's not good at all. No. So, critters, critters in the outdoors, you gotta keep your wits about you, and, Around you, and uh, I mean, one of the funniest ones that happened to me was a seal that came up behind me, and I didn't even know he was there. And we were fishing on where the Arctic Creek meets the Bering Sea, and we were fresh run salmon for dinner that night. We we're gonna pick up some salmon for supper, and I had a fish on, and literally not five, six, seven feet behind me, I've got a huge seal. <laughs> and, I turned around and he made a noise and I like to almost jumped in the creek because it was like, oh my God, where did you come from? And the other guys on the other side knew he was there. Oh, so they're, and they're off they in the distance. They told me later pointing. they had said nothing because he, he just comes wandering up there. And he's a bum. He's, he's been coming the whole time. They, you know, and they'll flip him a fish. And he wanted my fish. Right, so they figured, well, we ain't going to give Chuck a heads up. We'll get a kick out of his no. reaction. Yeah, and, and I was doing a high step down the, down the bank a little ways. and uh, But the thing is, is you got the water rushing by there and the ocean behind you because it makes a turn and runs parallel for a ways to the ocean and then changes its outflow from time to time with how the sand moves on high and low tide. And so it's noisy. I didn't. I had no idea it was there, man. I was concentrating on catching some salmon. <laughs> well, I guess in that aspect, though, it's better to turn around and see a seal than a bear. Yep. <laughs> yep. You you might have been walking on water then. Well, I saw my wife do that when she ran into a copperhead in North Carolina. Oh, so it sounds I like she's up had her here down, too. Right. It was down on Polly Spout Road. Uh, there's places where you can go dredge, you pay them a trespass fee and you can dredge. So I took my small dredge with me and we're down there, I was setting up the dredge and she, Jill was rock hounding and she does rather well. She got amethyst, she got all some, some awesome stuff down there. Uh, emerald, barrel, uh, very nice. She, she did real good. It cost me a fortune getting jewelry made, but she did good. <laughs> and, uh, I'm setting the dredge up, get it running. She's over on the opposite side of the creek bank. <laughs> I just get her running, and I'm working down a piece of bedrock. And I look up, and she is on a dead run across this, above me on this creek. I swear to God she ran on water. I really do. I don't think she got wet. <laughs> and she come up, pointing over across the bank there. She said, she telling me I saw this shiny, pretty real rock, and I reached down to grab it, and it moved, and here's the biggest copperhead I ever saw. And I said, well, <laughs> I said, well don't, don't poke at him, and don't get him too upset. She said, well, you're some big help. I said, why would you, <laughs> why would you reach down to that? Well, I thought it was, I thought it was, you know, something I wanted, like a rock. It was shining so nice, and she said, that's all I saw of it. So she went up to the owner up there, they were up on the porch area and told him about it. He said, you shouldn't poke snakes and them big ones won't bother you. It's the little ones that you got to worry about. Right, yeah, you probably shouldn't try to pick them up. 
So, so that that's her story, and she tells it a little differently than I do. But <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, she was running on top of that water. <clears throat> well, that's a way to keep her on her toes. Oh man, I heard about that for a long time. Right, yeah, the way it sounds, I'll bet she wasn't real happy with any of the advice you had to give her that day. And two old boys up on the porch didn't help either. <laughs> no, no, I'm I'm sure that's just insult to injury, so to speak, and she's going, oh yeah, fine help you two are as well. Yeah, and, and she said, aren't you worried about him? I said, did he come out and swim by or anything? She said, no, he just kind of went up along the bank, and I said, there you go. Right. I keep my eyes open. I did. I kept my eyes open on her and dredge. Actually, I did pretty good down in that hole. I got I got some nice pickers and that kind of stuff out of it, so I was happy. <clears throat> right. Going, well, he's not bothering me, so I'm not bothering him. That's right. So she's had her run-ins when she's been with me in some places. <laughs> Maybe. Like I that, said. That could be why it ahead. cost you a fortune in jewelry. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, she found a big fractured chunk of amethyst. <clears throat> and uh, it was hardball-sized, but it was all fractured up. But she kept holding it up. She says, I think the center of this is good enough for a cut. I said, okay. So I took her down, and the, they, they had a guy that would cut them and take a look at them in the area. So we took it over to him, and he said, he said, the only way I'm going to know, and he looked right at her, is make a cut. And if I got your permission to cut it, because it could come apart and you just got a pile of small amethyst then, he made a cut and pulled it in that heart, and that thing was beautiful. And she's got an eight-carat pear shape wrapped in gold from North Carolina. Nice. I had, we had a cut, and it's deep purple. It's beautiful. She was right. She was 100% right. It was a nice piece. She got moss agate then. She got, uh, you no, know, she found all kinds of stuff. We had it cut, made earrings made for her and different things like that. So she found some pretty nice stuff. Nice. That's what I've always heard is like the, uh, the darker the color, the, uh, the more appealing it is as far as people purchasing or if you're trying to sell your piece or anything like that when it comes to the amethyst. They want it yeah, nice and dark you know, and clear. Dark, clear, and bigger, larger, and uh, because it's it, they literally mine it down there. Wow! But she came across this one big chunk, and she was pretty happy with that. And they had that cut made out of it. That's a pretty cool piece. Nice. So, yeah, and she she yeah, was I doing all of this. Really she was doing all of this while you were dredging then, so there was a little bit of everything going on down there. Yep, and poking snakes. Well, yeah, trying to trying to pick up copperheads while she's at it, too. Okay, Ohio Relic Hunter, what is a moss agate? Moss agate, when it is cut, literally has like... You cut it, it looks like it's got moss growing through it. It's, it's, it's white with a brownish-red color. It's real pretty. Uh, and I, until she found that and verified what it was, she kind of knew what they were and took it to that jeweler and he made two square for hanging earrings and they're, they're neat, polished it up. And, uh, it's got this, it's mossy look through it. It cuts and, and they cut it and make jewelry out of it. My wife knows more about that stuff. I know gold. <laughs> right, yeah. I was going to say, when it comes to uh, prospecting, you know, that's that's definitely your arena of forte, but it, you haven't really done a whole lot of fossicking that I can recall, at least as far as gemstones, you know, the, the different, uh, like the amethyst and emerald and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, Still. You, you've got a you've got a post that they're talking about. I see on your site now with pink elephant. Mike Lockman put it up for you. I'm gonna have to check that out. Yeah, we got something going on there. <laughs> and, oh. 
All right, Ohio sounds like we got it covered. Ohio route kind of Google the uh, the the Moss Hagen. I you know she's the one that finds this stuff. She knows she knows what she's doing with that. She grew up down in uh, Keokuk area, and if any of you go out and and do gemstoning or you go into rock shops, you'll see Keokuk geodes. Now those things look cool, and. Her family farm, you walk that creek and literally pick geodes up all over. Oh, wow. To the point, yeah, to the point that her dad had a guy come in. They took the backhoe out and found pieces or these these geodes that literally were huge. I'm talking they had to use the bucket to get them up, and there was one that went to the Smithsonian from down there through her family. Her dad recovered that. That is cool. Yeah. So, and they take them, crack them. I got geodes out in the yard she's brought back in all her flower gardens and stuff. I yeah, can that, find geodes. I went geode hunting with her quite a bit. Yeah, that that would be cool to have out there in your uh, your landscaping, so to speak. I've I've seen people do it before with uh say silver ore for example where they've put that out in their flower bed or driveway. Yep. I've got I've got uh, over on the one I brought back core samples that were drilled in Wyoming down through uh the quartz deep and looking, you know, doing gold checks on it. And I've got some of those core samples that were there. Now they take them, they slice them thin, polish them, and sell them as core sample jewelry out of the area out there. Right, yeah, I see uh, a lot of the times you'll see slices of meteorite being sold that way as well, where they slice it up real thin and, you know, acid etch it or polish it up. Looks cool. Definitely interesting and, pieces to have in your collection. Yeah. So, when you're all out looking for this stuff, you run into the critters because, well, the the family farm down in Missouri, the south, uh, this is great, south fork of the Fabius River is where all this stuff come out of. That's that's amazing to go down there. And let's go geode hunt, man. Literally, you can find them rather easily on that section. <clears throat> that sounds like a mouthful of a tongue twister. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, think about the Fabius there, the South Fork of the Fabius River in Philadelphia, Missouri. Wow. Yeah, I think I'll stick with like <laughs> rubber baby buggy bumpers or something. <laughs> there you go. All right. So anyway. Man. Well, I'm not sure what post of mine they were talking about in there, but hey, I guess apparently they were looking at something. Well, let's see. Yeah, where's that at? Mark posted up. ML, saw your pink elephant post on Beyond Sight and Sound. Hmm. And then he said something about he shared it to my site, too. I haven't had a chance to go look, so we'll have to check out Mike. Oh, yeah, okay. Apparently there's something <laughs> on the pages that we'll have to go and take a look at. Yeah, well, it's, it's, so. and when it comes to Mike, it's hard to tell. I guess we'll have to go and check it out and see what he's surprised us with now. <laughs> he's funny like that. He right. He, he, he'll keep you on your toes. Yes, he will. Well, I'm going to back he out of here, buddy. Good. All right. And, uh, Maybe somebody else get in there and give us some of their stories. Right, yeah, we'll give them a few minutes and see if they can hop in with a story or two as well, and then we'll, I'll probably get on out of here then after that and uh, go check out your Go Live and Mike's post. <laughs> yep, and Tom Hatfield, I would love to tra- traverse wild Africa. It's always been something I've wanted to do, but with some of the regime over there, it's kind of something that you may not come back from, and it's not the wild animals. So, anyway, thanks, yeah. Josh, for having me on. We'll talk again. Yeah, not a problem. Thanks for the call, Chuck, and good luck out there in the field. Hopefully you can get out digging again soon. Hopefully I can get out digging again soon. Uh, hey, you found, uh, was that was that diamond? Oh, that earring? Yeah. 
Uh, you know, honestly, I haven't tested it yet. I mean, I do have a I diamond tester know. in the safe, but I'm going to go with the train of thought that it's CZ because there's no stamp on the back of the earring. And oh. I, I would think maybe I would be led to believe it could be diamond had it been stamped with, you know, 10K or something, but... I, sure, they put they put diamonds in silver too, but I really don't see them putting them, you know, putting money into a stone to put it on a junk piece of metal. Right. Stranger I things have curious, happened. What, which detector were you using? The Equinox eight hundred with the uh, with the Mine Lab Profine thirty five pen pointer. I had won that. I saw uh, that. I won that pen pointer last week, and I thought, hey, you know, I, I've heard from Jesse and Chuck and, and a few other people that they really seem to like that pen pointer, so I'm looking forward to getting this thing out in the field and trying it out. And, uh, yeah, I, the first target out, I hit that infant's ring, which is a really, really small ring. I can't even get that past my, my pinky fingernail. Really? That thing's so small when... I I assumed it was just a piece of bling, but then when we got it home and cleaned it up, Tam said that it was stamped in the band, and and I'm like, well, what did it say, 925 or S-T-E-R or what? And she says, it said Sterling. I said, that band ain't big enough to say Sterling. <laughs> she said, yeah, it, it takes the whole band, but it <laughs> it is stamped Sterling, <clears throat> wow. and it's... Uh, Very cool. It's strikingly, for for me anyway, I don't know, maybe some other people have a different opinion, but for me, it looks very strikingly similar to Native American jewelry. So... Excuse me. Uh, hey, hey, you ought to ask Mark. I saw some pictures. I don't know. Where was he at? Was he at, up in Montana or somewhere recently? Idaho. Where, where were you at, Mark? I seen a picture you posted. I believe it was Idaho anyway. Idaho. I didn't know if he was detecting up there or what. Well, if if you saw the same picture I saw, I would say he was detecting because it looked like he had his, uh, oh, yeah. who makes that? The Buzz Wilson chief, I think is what it is. And he had his knee pads on, so I'm assuming they must have been out hunting him and, and the other gentleman in the oh, photo. Oh, or something? That's a good question. I'm not real sure. Yeah, whether he was out for gold ore or ghost town. Right. Old placer. He was and, doing an old gold town. And I guess, uh, and, and you can probably chime in on that as well, for people that are getting a little heavy with their discrimination on the Equinox, probably not a real good idea because that, I mean, it had no problem finding that earring. But it was just solid tone. Uh, I think it was ringing up low like a eight on the Equinox. Mm -hmm. Yep. You want a six and eight and ten. You want to dig those. You're gonna you're gonna find that some of that's gonna be pretty good stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. It had me digging bits of foil for about thirty minutes after that to see if I could find its friend. But uh, at least I got the earring. But no, it, the earring's not stamped with any sort of mark, so I'm going to assume that it's probably just CZ. But still, to find a small earring like that, I was pretty tickled. And it followed yeah, up cool. nicely with that uh, that infant's ring that I had found a, a little while before that, and then I also came up with a, a championship cross and country medal, too, out there. I saw that. That one Did kind of post? that one kind of baffles me a little bit because on the back it says uh ninety four WBL champs. So you would yeah. think that that would be simple enough to track down because you know for for somebody to win somebody's got to lose. There couldn't have been that many winners. But we're talking about a medal that was awarded twenty four years ago. Wow. And I didn't dig for that. 
I mean, it was a screaming signal. I thought it sounded like it was on top of the ground. I brushed the grass aside, and it's laying there face down. So it was probably a recent loss. Or, I don't know, maybe the tornado picked it up and threw it over there for some reason. But uh, definitely an interesting find. Mark, you should call in. I got questions for you. Why weren't you looking for gold? Guys were out detecting for gold. Maybe you were. You got it. You got it. Eight hundred. Right. It would have found it if it was there. It does pretty good. It does pretty good. It's no. It's no PI unit or anything like that. But they do pretty well. No, but there again, for for a detector in that price point range. That is a very well-rounded, good-performing machine. It and very, like, very, very yeah, sensitive to it, small targets and gold. That, that, that's morphed away from up and beyond the 705. And that 705, uh, I found a lot of good gold with that unit. Very unsung hero in the gold field. They didn't push that hard enough. Right. Right. So, have you heard? Uh, have you heard any more on the Vanquish? Or has my yeah, lab not said much more yet? Trickling out. Uh, there's some things coming down the pike here. They're going to let loose with. They got a little short video out on it, you guys, if you haven't seen that. And then the other one is the Simplex, and I was trying to fish for that. And yeah. the other day, and it, there's no, there's no. Yeah, we, line on that. So the Vanquish will be out. And it's going to start moving a little faster. That's all I can tell you about that. Nice. I look forward to seeing, well, especially that Simplex coming out. And I don't know, Mark may be kind of interested in that himself, which he is on here now, if you want to grill him with those questions. <laughs> hey, Mark, hey, what's Chuck up? And Josh. Hey, Mark. How are you? Hey there. So how'd you do detecting the ghost town? Well, you know, Chuck, I, you know, I did okay. Um, I was focusing myself mostly on relics from the wow. town that was there. Um, uh, and it's about an hour outside of Boise. I, we, we call it Diamondville, but we don't really want to name the, where the location is because, you know, somebody may try to go in there. But in Diamondville, it's my second year or my second time there. I went there in 2017. As a guest of Rob Johnson, um, who uh, runs the Spud Digger site out in Idaho. Oh yeah, yeah, the uh, uh, the Rob. old bottle you found that time. That's exactly right, Josh. You got a good memory. And uh, so uh, this time, though, we had a couple of guys that were uh, Jim McCullough in particular, who's written hundreds of articles and several books on gold prospecting. Now, the area is great for relics because there was, used to be a town there. Um, you know, it can be good for gold if you got the right machine and you know what you're doing, uh, which we had the right people there. The problem is for me on the gold, and it wasn't, you know, a huge problem, but there, there was, a, you know, going up the mountain, it was clearly blasted away, and it left a, a fairly sizable bowl where you could climb down in and start, you know, prospecting for gold uh, using your metal detector with, you know, with, with gold in the rocks. The problem was uh, the number of people that were there. I just decided that um, rather than trying to, you know, crawl over people and everybody's trying to do the same thing, I just decided to go to a different area and hunt for relics. Uh, some guys did find some gold and, uh, they did really well. I mean, they found like some sizable rock chunks that had gold veins in them. Yep. And, uh, Jim was able to verify that. And they, uh, so, so it was a great weekend. I got to say, you know, it's just a lot of fun going out there, uh, camping. Um, we had about, I want to say 20, 20 to five people there, 26 people. And, um, you know, it's all tent camping, and now people are bringing in their campers. But I was tent camping because I had to fly in and carry all my stuff with me. Um, but, 
Yeah, we somebody brought a camper in and did all the cooking for us. We just paid for the for them to cook the meals, and then they allowed us to do some relic hunting. Now, the thing is, is that I found an old uh, one of the old axe heads. I found a lot of glass bottles. Um, that we actually found a bottle dump there, and unfortunately, I didn't get to dig it as much as I would would have liked to. We didn't find it until later in the trip, but um, it's a and it's an area that Rob has access to. That he doesn't own it, but uh, the owner of of the land is actually trying to sell it. So um, this may be the oh, last boy. time we can go back. Wow, yeah, that's that Mark. Yeah, uh, actually, while you were talking, Mark, we did have another caller come through. Hopefully, his audio is coming through all right. But we've actually been joined by River Sticks Outdoors too. Yeah, Mark, where? where hey, Tom. That? How you doing, Mark? This is yeah. This is in Idaho. Uh, it, you fly into Boise, and then it's about an hour uh, up into the uh, Gold Country outside of uh, Boise, and. You know, there, that whole area, I, I just posted on Adventures in History, my Facebook group, a series of pictures from Placerville, uh, Idaho. Uh, and uh, we visited that town, which is not where we were hunting, but it's similar to what we were hunting. But Placerville still has about, I don't know, they, you know, one time in the 1800s, they had over 5,000 people, and now it's got less than 100 but they still have a few businesses there. They have a museum that we visited. And uh, so I took a lot of pictures in Placerville just to show people what some of the relics were, you know, would, would look like coming out of that area. And it really well, takes I, you back I, I in time. Wanna, I don't want to cut you off, but those pictures of me on my website where I, where I, where I have the pictures of the, the iron skillet with the fish, that was actually the Bull River yeah. in Idaho. Okay. That's awesome. So, I do come through Boise. I'm going to look you up so we can go hunt. Well, well I don't live in Boise. I live in Florida. Yeah, you won't <laughs> find Mark in Boise. Oh, he's not. But, no, so you'll... If, you, if you go... Go ahead. Go ahead. So, so, Tom, I live in Florida, but I travel quite a bit, and uh, I... If you're in an area where you know where uh, where I'm traveling to, I would absolutely love to hunt with you. Or if you come to Florida, you know we can hunt here too. I, I live 17 miles out of Ocala. Well, let's hunt in Ocala then. <laughs> there you go. Right? Yeah, that's, I I that's, figured that's crazy. I'm thinking he's up here in in Idaho, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to hook up with him when I get mm. there. No, no, I I figured I'd let Mark break that to you, that he's a whole lot closer than you may realize, or you're a, lo a whole lot closer than he may realize. Wow. A small world. I live in uh, Altamont out Springs, to be exact. Well, I'm in Citra. Right and I know Citra very, I know Cit yeah, I know Citra very well. I just hunted in Hawthorne about two weeks ago. That's just north of Citra. That's in the next city. Yep. Across right. the bridge. Yeah, it's in the next city. Yeah, we we have permission from the mayor to hunt there. you got to be kidding. In Hawthorne itself? In Hawthorne, yeah. By by, by the post office or, by, or, or over by Orange Lake? So there's a, there's a city park there that it's by Orange Lake. And it's, it's, I think it's, I forget what, yeah, what the exact name of it is, but. Cross, yeah, that, Cross Creek. That part. It's Cross Creek. Yeah, it's Cross, that's right. Cross Creek is where we hunted. Uh, I know the area well. There you, You've got to be kidding me. Sounds like you guys need to know where we hunted. Together. Chat. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's crazy. That's crazy. I know Cross Creek very well. Right? Yeah. It's, yeah, so the mayor. Yeah, go ahead. Florida is a, uh, well, you could say Florida is a very uh, supportive state for Beyond Sight and Sound. But likewise, we, we do like to mention the CFMDC and things of that nature. Good club down there. You may want to look into them. 
I'm sure Mark can give you all the information. <laughs> well, so in Tom's area, Tom, there's, uh, do you know Greg Papalo? I do. Oh, good point. Yeah. So Greg is putting on Florida Hunt 6 in uh, February, February. And then uh, Florida Hunt 5 is coming up in October. And, uh, we, we, and I don't know where either one of them are, but Florida Hunt is 5 is in a, Seminole County. Is, is it going to be in Orange Lake or Loch Lusa? No, he's not. It's going to be away from there. But he's gotten permission on a really, really nice piece of property. And he's keeping it very secret, which I agree with him on. And uh, there, there's a there's a group page now called Florida Hunt Six. Go look for it. You can sign up there. Uh, oh, he's still taking oh. sign ups there, it's, and it's going to be. Uh, I forget the exact amount. I want to say he's going to charge like thirty dollars per person, and that's going to go towards a particular charity that actually owns the property that's never been hunted before, and it goes back to the 1800s. We're, we're not talking about Marjorie's. Well, we're not talking about anything that I'm even aware of. I just know that he's going to right. do it. I don't know where it is. Yeah, Craig hasn't uh, let the location out yet. Well, you know, you know, right there in Cross Creek is Marjorie Keenan Rollins. If anybody ever saw the movie right, that's, Gregory Pack, that was Cross Creek. That, yeah, that's across the street. Isn't isn't there like a place across the street from Cross Creek, Marjorie? Was that the same Marjorie place? Marjorie Keenan Rollins. That was her. That was her plantation. I got you. No, he's he's I'm, doing I'm four to hunt familiar. six. Yeah, he's doing four to hunt six uh, in a completely different area from there. Well, you just gave me. So, is this open to anybody <laughs> or just Florida residents? Well, Chuck, uh, no, it's not just Florida residents. Anybody can come down for it. Uh, oh, I'd, you know, that's gonna be good. it sounds like the Florida boys were talking close sell there, and I just thought I'd ask because February is is a good time for me to get the living daylights out of Illinois. And I'm I'm pretty Absolutely. sure I'm pretty sure they could probably uh, you know get you all set up there, Chuck. Yep. Well, yep. I have to talk the- with them. For the, for those of you that don't know, if you if you research in Google Cross Creek by Marjorie Keenan Rawlings, that was the movie done with Gregory Peck and I forget the the female, but that was about the whole deer and everything in the plantation and the orange fields. That was that was right where he's talking about, and they did um, they did Cross Creek and they did um, what was the other name of the other movie? There was there was Cross Creek and there was. It, it wasn't Orange Lake, but it's just right on. See, Orange Lake and Lake Lakloosa are joined by a, a little canal, and half the time it's accessible by even airboats. Half the time it's not because of the, of the sinkhole. But where he's talking about is is huge history, because she came down from New York like in 1912 or whatever. You know, way back. I don't I don't remember the date exactly. But where he's talking about has huge history all the way down to the, the, the citrus plantations for the orange lemons and everything else. It, oh, wow. There there was actually a bot there was a botanist and I just don't remember his name off the top of my head, but he came down uh from New England and went all the way through Florida and did a lot of research and, and, here and now. So did Marjorie. So did Marjorie. She has a house there, it's a museum now. Well, we went into a museum and I don't I don't know if that was her house, but we went into a museum right there in Hawthorne where we did a lot of the uh, Friday night meet and greet and uh, did, a, did a lot of the, you know, talking to the museum curator there. That, that, that and then when we, in Rawlings' house. That, That's the only house, museum okay. in Hawthorne. Uh, That's good to know. I, I didn't put that together maybe at the time, but the next day when we hunted, and it was called Florida Hunt 4, uh we we actually found several home sites that were no longer there and one of the uh one of the detectors that was there Brian Robinson found a trigger guard uh that had RI stamped on it when they did the research they figured out that 
the RI was from a Rhode Island factory in a date. That particular trigger guard came off of a rifle from the British militia, and 2,000 of those rifles were manufactured in 1776. Wow. And, and when Mar and when Marjorie Keenan Rawlings moved down from New York, she came with the the well, I don't want to call it troops per se, but the militia wow. because right. of the natives and the Indians. And she set up her and she set up her plantation, and she had the orange plantation. For anybody that's interested in looking this up, look up um, Cross Creek or the Yearling. Remember the Yearling. That was that was the right. The yeah, that's King right. Collins wrote. She wrote the yearly right. Gregory back. That's exactly where he's talking about. That's four miles from my house. Nice. Really? Yes. Well, uh, Bill Bill Marsh just posted in. That was William Bartram, who was the botanist that came down exactly and right. and went all through right Florida. Yeah. Yep. And uh, so anyway, we we. Uh, so I, it's not like I come up there all the time, but we had Florida Hunt Four there, and then a few weeks ago we came back. We were we uh, worked with Greg to go back there with a small, just a small group. Now I will tell you this: um, I'm a little disappointed because it's pretty obvious that people have been going in there and hunting it, and maybe hunting it without permission because we did find. I would say quite a number of holes that were not filled in that park when we went back. So we were not only hunting and detecting, but we were also trying to fill holes and, and uh, you know, kind of clean it up a little bit. Uh, well, there's actually, you, you, did, did you see the yearling restaurant right there, right at the bridge, exactly where the creek is? I did not. I, I If I did, I didn't notice it. Okay, well, if you come around the curve up from Marjorie Keenan Rollins' place, which is the historical landmark, which is federal, okay, there's the yearly mm -hmm. restaurant, and there's the bridge that is right on Cross Creek. On the north side of yeah, Cross Creek. Yeah, I know Creek, where the bridge is. Okay, yeah. okay. Well, on the north side of that is Gary Palmetter. That's a personal friend of mine. He owns all that land on the north side of the creek there. So, well, let's go uh, hunt. Well, I can get in. I can get in. Right. The I guarantee. I you where nobody else can oh that's awesome well you know that's that's great well um so yeah i hunted in idaho and then i came back in back to florida but um you know obviously as you know we have tremendous history here in florida um you just have to do the research and find the right people and um and uh, i was very thankful to greg because greg was the one who got us the permission, and and we went over there to the went over there to the park. Nice. Thanks. Well, I I don't know Greg personally. When you asked me, did I know the name? I said yes, I do. I know the name very well. I've seen it on 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 the, the different forums. But well, they have a they have a club. The closest. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I, I was just going to say to go further than that. You know, I, I have to get contact info. Same as you. Yeah, so they have Greg. Greg is uh, the president of the Gainesville Club, which is probably the closest club to you. And uh, you, you, you definitely. I mean, what I'll do is uh, I'll figure out a way on uh, Facebook to you know give, send you guys a joint message and do an introduction because you're definitely going to want to be a part of Florida Hunt Six. And for anybody else that's listening, it's not just for Florida. And I will. I noticed that somebody said they couldn't find it. It may be. Uh, it may be a close It may not group. be easily found. Yeah, secret I'll find group. it and I'll post it in here. Yeah, exactly. There's probably a secret group by now. You'll have yeah. to be invited, so I'll send you an invitation to it. Well, please uh, do. Because, well, I'd, you know, I'd like to see. Anybody else that's interested in coming down here, I, I, I know the land. I know the area. I stayed at Gary's in my RV when I was, on, when I was having spinal surgery. For a couple of years in my RE, so I know, I know the area quite well. I've caught many a gator and turtle and everything else out of there. Did we lose the signal? No, no, no. You're on there. Oh. You're on there yet, Mark? Yeah. So, uh, well, anyway, that was a that was an interesting, uh, you know. Uh, segue, but uh, going back to Idaho for just a second, uh, Chuck, that was my second time 
out there. And while I was out there, um, I can't say a whole lot other than the fact that we actually were able to secure a permission at another gold mining site in Montana. So um, we're trying to work on putting together a trip out there. Well, that'd be great. That would be great for you. That's that's great area on the gold mining history and the prospecting and 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 that type of stuff. Usually, uh, I get to uh, well, places I've been to <laughs> end up uh, if the gold's not hitting, you're doing relics, and uh, that that's a good way to go at it. Well, you know what's interesting? Uh, it, well, it was a real blessing, uh, Rob. Uh, Johnson is unlike a lot of people I know. I mean, he doesn't have to share that site with people, and yet he invites other people to come in once a year with him, and it's almost like a a, a reward or an award. Uh, they go around to some of the um, clubs in that area, and they'll they'll offer um, a couple of you know free trips to the site with the group. And so they give them away. They they win them at the club. Uh, I won a trip the first year. That's how I was able to go, and he invited me back this time. And uh, so a lot of those guys don't really see Civil War relics. So uh, not that I've dug a lot, but I, I have access to them. So I took some Civil War relics out there to give away as prizes because what they do um, – at the end of the hunt is we put all of the finds on a very large table and then the cook who doesn't hunt or detect at all comes and she uh, decides she, she picks her favorites like one, two, three and, oh, and uh, cool. her, her, you know, her, her favorite finds, you know, nice and, way to do it. Yeah, and it's not always, yeah, and it's not always what you think it would be. You know, you, you think, okay, well, this is what I think it should be. And then she picks something completely different. So one of the, I think, you know, from the detectorist point of view, one of the coolest finds that all of us would have picked as number one was somebody found a brass 1918 Idaho Shopers license. Oh, nice. very nice. And, uh, and uh, she was actually digging literally right next to me when we were digging bottles and she didn't dig it with a uh, metal detector and she didn't even have a, you know, a decent shovel. And she found this uh, particular shows license. What I found out and what I was, (laughs) what's that? I I was kidding. I said it apparently was more decent than yours at the time. Oh yeah. Well, you know, and and the thing was, you know, we, uh, when she, well, Hers was not picked as, you know, one of the top three, which we were like, oh, my gosh. Well, there was a dealer there, a white dealer, who made his own decision and said, you know what? There's a very special find on this table that we all recognize, and I'm going to give her a brand-new white digging shovel for that find. And that's, and he so she got an award anyway. Very cool. And uh, what we were t- – yeah, that was kind of a really nice gesture. And uh, what we found out was, or what we were told was, the chauffeur license back in, in those years, 1980, because I mean, you're not, you know, automobiles weren't around that long in 1980. Right. But anyway, chauffeur license was actually your driver's license. You had to wear that to drive a car. Yeah. Nice. I did not know that. That's what we were told. Um but anyway, uh, Rob invited us all out, and so, you know, they did, they set up uh, uh, a gold panning area where they uh, taught people how to, you know, pan for gold. Uh, we went into the bowl. They, they showed us how to detect, you know, for gold. And, uh, you know, uh, I would tell you, Chuck, it was the, the two machines that really did the best as far as finding the gold were, the Equinox 800 and the White's 24K Goldmaster were the two machines that were uh, doing really well on finding gold. I just wonder if anybody was running a gold monster. Maybe they should have. Uh, a little I see them 1,000 by yeah, I think my lab. Uh, somebody had an SDC. 
SDC 2300. Uh huh. Yeah, that's the mill. You're familiar one. with that one? The one that the one that kind of folds <laughs> up and you know is. Uh, you know, that's Chuck, very, uh, that's, you know, Chuck is probably style. more familiar with that than most. <laughs> yeah, I use that a lot in the last because of its toughness. Right, I that's remember some machine. of the stories yeah. you've told me. Yep, they're a good gold machine. So, but I, don't I guess, you know, tying, tying it all up, Chuck, for me, you know, as as much as I love history... Uh, you know, I wanted to know the history of the area and I went to the yeah. museum in Placerville. We went to the cemetery in Placerville. Um, I've done the research on the area where we were actually digging, uh, Diamondville. Uh, and, uh, it, it was, uh, there, you know, back in the, uh, 1860s through the 1880s, you know, grew to about 5,000, but, slowly dwindled off and in 1935 i think i had told this story before a fire went through there and just burned the entire town down and they tried to revive it they never really could and so we we found a lot of melted glass and broken glass and things like that mm -hmm. so to find any single whole bottle that hadn't been broken or burned or melted uh oh. was, was pretty uh yeah, it's pretty hard to do. That's why when I found that bottle the last time, uh, I was really thrilled to be able to do that. This time, though, we did find a bottle dump uh, higher up on a ridge that apparently wasn't affected by the fire. So uh, they're going to be pulling out a lot of bottles over there in the next year. Well, many of those old old mining towns, many of them burnt. Uh, Nome burnt three times, and they pushed it every time into the ocean and started again. Uh, right. Deadwood had a. They, they've all had some sort of a fire. They were they were quickly put up and light lumber and and that kind of stuff. And the the brick and mortar ones that did go up generally survived, uh, not always. And uh, you will find a lot of burnt. And, and, and South Dakota, I did a lot of detecting in Deadwood early on, and that was one of my favorite favorite places to go because you could be at that time they. Pretty much let you detect anywhere and you could find things. And I have two tokens and the one it just says number 10 on it. And I didn't think much about it until I showed it to a token that that guy up here, Gary Cusell is his name in Minnesota. He collects tokens big into it and he likes to trade and he goes, what do you want for that? And I said, I know what that is, but it took me a while to find out. Um, Bill Hickok, when he came into Deadwood, and and he he spent a lot of time in the number ten because basically they paid him to be there. Ah, <laughs> nice. He was a big draw, and the number ten had tokens made up that they gave to Hickok to hand out to come in for a drink. And if you had the number ten token. He got a drink, and then they'd give them back to Hickok, and he'd hand them out to pack people in the drink and take on other persuasions that were upstairs. And <laughs> they're rare. They're hard to find, and I didn't know it at the time. And I have one that I recovered in Deadwood, and uh, that was one of my favorite finds. They're so rare that uh, they're quite valuable, and they have to be verified. And I sent it to PGCS, and it got verified. Nice. Good job. Oh, that kind of yeah, that is nice. Yep, and he's the guy that handed them out. They, they, I, and they, they don't know the number that was ever made. There's no track of mintage on it. Yeah, but still, that's cool to have a token that you you know was essentially handed out by Bill Hickok. Yep. Yeah, that and is that, pretty cool. That's that's, that's amazing. Hit, there was a very notable Western figure that moved to Nome, and they had their own bar there, and they made a lot of money and left Nome. That was Wyatt Earp. Right. Wyatt Earp went up to Nome? So, so yeah. Josh, who was I talking to this whole time? Was that Ohio, Ohio Relic Hunter? On the phone? No, that's Mark Hoover. That was Mark Hoover. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just want to get my ducks in so, 
Tom, I'll send you a message, and I'll send you a link to uh, Florida Hunt 6, and I'll well, do the same. Josh, Josh has all my info. Okay. All right. And, uh, include me I'm, on that I'm, link, I'm too, will you, there, Mark, you. on uh, because, the number six hunt? That sounds interesting. Uh, yeah, Florida Hunt 6, I'll do that, Chuck. I'll send yeah. that link, too. Yeah, heck, yeah, might, like, like, might as well just like go said, ahead. And, I'm excited to hunt with you because I think we can that probably won't be allowed otherwise. Might as well go ahead and throw me in that communication too. Who knows? Maybe uh, maybe Chuck and I'll just pack up the equinoxes and head south. <laughs> and come on, you you come on down. Yeah, and and Mark, you know there is a open slot for you to go to Nome with me next year. Yeah, let's. Yeah, we we, we definitely need to chat about that. So uh, let's talk about that next week. Yep, right. we will. All right. Well, anyway, I guess... I... All right. Yeah, time to back out of here. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. Thanks for the call, Chuck. All righty. Gentlemen, it was a pleasure. Thanks for calling in. And then you Florida boys need to get together and keep me posted. Yes, right. Sir. Absolutely. All right. Have a great right, night. I'm going to back out, too, and... Thanks, Chuck, and I'll talk to you later. And uh, Tom, it's a pleasure. I look forward to chatting with you soon, and uh, I'll send you all I'm, my I'm information sure we'll as see, well. I'm sure we'll see each other. I'm sure we will. Oh, Tom, I'd like to get Thanks down and meet you. Take care. Yeah, you too, Bye-bye. Chuck. Absolutely. All right. all right. Thanks for call, Mark. Thanks again, Chuck. All right. Good night, Josh. Good night, Tom. Good night. <laughs> Man, it we getting kind of a full cool. house had, tonight. But I had no idea this was going on right down the street from my house. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's that that's the really, that was really cool. Well, and and this was previous hunts, but still. Yeah. You never. Yeah, but it's about a hunt also coming up, and and I and I know Gary on the north side of the road. He won't let anybody in, but I know him personally. I know him, his daughter, his wife. You know what I mean? I know right, family. right, right. So well, hopefully I can take these guys in on somewhere else. Right, yeah, you never know. Definitely. Definitely never know. I mean, know. It's, just, it's just a couple of acres, but a couple of acres can mean a lot. Right. Yeah, you never know. Certainly never know. And I guess uh, for for everyone else that's uh, been tuning in, obviously River Sticks Outdoors, his links are still in the description of tonight's show for the YouTube channel and his uh, Facebook page, River Sticks Outdoors, and a direct link to the contest that he's currently running. But I got to tell you, follow the rules. Please read, read, the, read the description. <laughs> read the instructions with the giveaway video if you're going to try and get yourself entered. And other than that, I think we've ran on long enough tonight, so we're probably going to be rolling on out of here. But before we do, I guess it's it's been a while since we've had a first-time caller into the show, and you were a first-time caller into the show tonight, so I think uh, give me your your shirt size information, and we'll get a Beyond Sight and Sound shirt out to you, courtesy of Detectees.com and Beyond Sight and Sound. Well, that well, that would be extra fat, you know, XL. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that's just XL, though. Yeah. <laughs> so not, that not super, not super fat, just extra fat. Right, right. So we will uh, definitely get that information passed along and everything, and and we'll try to get a shirt out to you here soon. For everyone else, thanks for tuning in. We're going to roll on out of here. If you enjoyed the show, make sure and throw us a like. You can follow us here on Spreaker, Facebook, many of the other wonderful podcast distribution services, and YouTube as well. Have a wonderful evening, folks. We'll see you on the next one.